So today's module, so originally we were just going to do Q&A today for just random questions and answers. However, because I had to be somewhere yesterday, um, we postponed our closing the sale and creating clients for life lesson till today. So I'm sure we'll wrap this up and have time for um, questions and answers. So if you have any random questions and answers that we've covered throughout this process, feel free to um, write them down, keep them with you, and we'll answer them at the end. Um, we will take off a week of time for tomorrow or next week. There will be no classes next week due to summit. And then we will hop back into the rev up series. It'll be an expanded rev up series um, starting the 28th, I believe is that Tuesday. So we'll keep it on the same schedule. It'll be Tuesday, Wednesday at 11 a.m. and then Thursday at 4 p.m. Thursday at four will generally be like a tech training where I've got a couple special guests scheduled for those time periods. So um, stay tuned for that. The schedule will probably come out uh, maybe next week or early. I've got it done. I just need to, we just need to solidify it and get it out. So um, we're working on that. So anyways, we're going to hop into closing the sale. The last session that we talked about was um, the listing, right? We talked about the um, finding potential sellers, and setting that listing appointment, what goes out in the pre-listing packet. And then last time we talked about the pre-listing agreement. Well, not last time, but the time before that. So it's two, three times ago, it was the pre-listing appointment. And then we talked about the listing appointment and getting that agreement signed. On Tuesday, we dove into that listing agreement um, and walked through how to fill that out appropriately um, in your car forms library. And now today we are talking about closing the sale. So when we have a listing, um, a lot of this filters over to the buyer as well, but closing the sale, what happens from the time we get an accepted offer until we get that sale closed, and then also creating those clients for life, both buyer and seller. So we are going to talk about what time is of the essence means, how to navigate the pending path successfully. Uh, typical due diligence types, timeframes, right? Uh, contingency removals, who assists with the pending path items, communication and follow up, um, and then creating clients for life. So when we have an accepted offer on a property, that is the time to open escrow. Um, hopefully we've all opened the pre-escrow. If we had our way, the buyers would always choose who we open pre-escrow with. So hopefully your escrow is already basically open. But the next step would be to make sure we get a copy of that fully executed contract, right? All the initials done, all the signatures done. If there's a counter offer, get that in and done um, to the other party. Make sure it comes back signed and agreed to. Um, we want to get that all over to our escrow officer. If they've selected their own escrow company, that's totally fine. The buyers in the state of California have the option to select the title and escrow company. We don't get to pick it as sellers. We just try to maneuver them into who we want them to use. Um, so uh, we would get that contract over to our escrow officer. Okay. And if it's one that they've selected, just make sure you have the email for that escrow officer, shoot over all the contracts to them to open escrow. Keep in mind that your contract is considered valid. It's considered accepted on the day that you email over to the buyer's agent, the signed purchase agreement, okay? That electronic delivery. So we don't have, they don't have to receive it anymore. A year and a half ago, they actually had to like physically receive it in their inbox now, we don't have to. Um, they just have to, we just have to have proof that we emailed it to them. That would make it an accepted contract. Okay. If there was a counter offer, the buyer's counter offer, we countered offered the buyers, then it would be the buyer sending that counter offer back to us. That would signify the fully accepted offer. Okay. So, um, and then if we counter, obviously, whoever's doing the counter, it's the other person that has to do the last signature. When they send it back, that would be the fully accepted. If we're doing a seller multiple counter offer, where we send out multiple counter offers, we use the SMCO form. Then it's not accepted when the buyer sends it back to us. It's only accepted once the seller selects which final multiple counter offer they're going to go with. They initial it and send it back to the buyer. That would be day zero. So the day of acceptance is day zero of your contract. Um, we start from that day and move forward. So if you have a 30 day escrow, the accepted day where we send that signed contract back to the other party would be day zero and we start counting from there. Okay. Amy, I have a question. 
Yes. So uh, the buyer has the right to select um, the um, title company. Uh-huh. Who said, and then the seller, seller's agent is the one that sends all the info to them? Uh, either party can send all the info to them. Um, if I've selected the title company, um, whether I'm the seller or the buyer on the property, I usually am the one that sends the contract over. But um, to expedite the process, I never wait for a buyer's agent to send the contracts to escrow. Um, if I'm the listing agent on the property and they've chosen a different company than who I have it pre-opened with, I always want to make sure I get that contact information and shoot those contracts over because I want to make sure we get that preliminary title report and all that title work done in a timely manner so that it doesn't delay our escrow or delay our contingency periods. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. So anybody can, however, if they don't do it immediately, then I send it over there. All righty. The closing of the sale. Um, time is of the essence. This is the really blurry slide. So just um, I need to redo it. There's a couple of these slides in here that need to be redone. But um, we want to make sure that we understand that time is of the essence, right? It talks about that in the residential purchase agreement. It talks about the fact that, um, you know, there's deadlines and things that happen in that contract. And it's what keeps us in contract, right? It makes the contract valid. Um, once we're operating outside of those time frames, it doesn't necessarily automatically negate the contract. It just means we need to get back into contract, right? So um, by either doing like an extension of time or removing contingencies or making sure the close of escrow happens, okay? So time is of the essence. We always send out on the seller side, if I have a listing, I always make sure that the other party and I are on the same page with regards to time frames, right? So I send out once we're in contract that usually gets sent out by my transaction coordinator, sends out a list of here's all the deadlines that I have as per the contract, the deposits due on this day, the inspection contingency removals this day, the appraisal contingency removals this day, right? The close of escrow is supposed to be this day. So I send that all out. So we make sure we're on the same page as we're moving forward through that contract, that there's not any questions or confusions regarding those timeframes. Um, we want to make sure we pay attention to those deadlines. Now, if I'm representing the buyer, and I think I've covered this before, I'm going to drag my feet on those contingency removals as long as possible until that other agent is badgering me for those contingency removals. The reason being is that I'm protecting my buyer. Once I remove those contingencies, I'm removing their ability to be able to cancel that contract. And I wanna protect that buyer. On the seller side of things, complete opposite, right? And this is why I'm always like, hey, there's so much gray area when it comes to representing both the buyer and the seller in a transaction. How do you represent both parties? How do you delay on removing a contingency for the buyer and push to get a contingency removed for the seller. Like, how do you navigate that? Um, it just can cause a lot of problems. But anyways, on my seller side, I'm going to make sure that if I don't have those contingency removals on time, that they're getting notices to perform. It's not personal, it's business. I'm going to explain that to the other agent. But if we're coming up on that loan contingency removal, you better believe I'm going to be on the phone with the other agent saying, hey, just checking in to see how the loan's going. And if I feel like I'm not getting a straight answer from them, I feel like they're going to delay. I'm also going to be in contact with that buyer's lender, talking with them, asking them the same questions on how it's going. And if I feel like we're not going to get that contingency removal on time, you can submit that contingency removal up to two days before the due date of that contingency time frame. I do not delay on my um, notices to perform, okay? I may wait until the day that it's due, but I'm definitely not like dragging my feet out three or four days past that due date. Just because I serve a notice to perform doesn't mean I have to cancel the contract. It just gives me the right to cancel the contract once those days have passed. So I always make sure that I stay on top of those timeframes. I'm making sure that the earnest money deposits go into escrow. I'm making sure the inspections, if they're going to have them, are getting scheduled in a timely manner. I'm checking in on that appraisal if I haven't heard from the appraiser, right? So I'm following up on all those time frames with the correct people as that transaction progresses, okay? Um, there is a transaction checklist that I shared in a previous file. Um, I'll make sure Abby throws it and um, shares that link again with that transaction checklist. 
with this training as well in the description of it that walks you through from pre-listing to post-close of escrow, the steps that you should take as part of that process. And you'll learn more as you're moving through it with your mentor. Okay, um, part of the steps of the escrow are number one, we're gonna open escrow. Number two, the buyer should be completing their loan approval process. The buyer should be completing their inspection process, the review of seller documents and disclosures. And they should be completing, getting that appraisal ordered and that appraisal um, should be getting scheduled. Okay, um, so you wanna make sure you're staying on top of that. They should be taking their earnest money deposit to the escrow company within the first three business days. Keep in mind, that's the only time frame that is affected by business days as far as the days to completion. So it's three business days. If it falls on a weekend, those don't count towards completion. It's just Monday through Friday and it doesn't count holidays. Um, so if it was this next week and your good faith deposit, you accepted an offer today, which is Thursday, be day zero, it'd be Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday is a federal holiday. It's President's Day. So you'd be Tuesday, Wednesday. If you have an accepted offer today, your deposit, if you left it at the default of three days, is not due until next Wednesday, okay? So we just skip over those um, federal holidays. And a federal holiday, it was redefined in the new residential purchase agreement. The federal ho or the holidays are defined as any time either the lender, the title company, or the recorder's office is closed. So it doesn't have to be all three of them. It can be just one of them is closed. It no longer counts as a business day. Okay. The other thing that happens. Yep. How does that work if they have like one of these online, not local um, lenders? It does not matter. Okay. It doesn't matter. If the lender is closed due to a federal holiday, then it's it would if the recorder's office and the title company is open, but the lender is closed due to a federal holiday, then it would be considered a holiday. Um, if your date, your due date for any of your time periods in your contract falls on a weekend or a holiday, it rolls to the next business day. So we always count those days. So if we had a three day inspection contingency and we accepted the offer today, today would be day zero. Um, Friday would be day one, Saturday would be day two, and Sunday would be day three. So technically they would, um, per the contract, it would be removed on Sunday. However, Sunday is a weekend. So it would roll to the next business day, which would be Tuesday because Monday is a holiday. So their inspection contingency, even though they said, hey, we have a three-day inspection contingency, it really truly wouldn't be due to be removed until Tuesday. So we count the days to include the holiday, but the action has to be performed on the next business day. Okay. Um, once all the inspections are completed, um, even though the sale is as is, it states that in our residential purchase agreement, you may have even put it in a counter offer. The buyer still has the right to ask for repairs or for a credit in repairs or a reduction in the purchase price due to repairs. Even if they have no inspection contingency, they can still ask for repairs. That does not mean that the seller has to agree to them. The seller can deny them. The seller doesn't even have to technically respond to the repair request if they don't want to. So just kind of keep that in mind, but the buyer can always ask for repairs. And I've had situations in the past where we agreed that, hey, the um, the sales price is as is. I have a VA buyer. They're willing to pay for all of their own pest repairs. Had a conversation with the agent before accepting the offer that, yeah, it's probably going to be two to $3,000 in pest repairs. Um, the pest repairs ended up coming back much higher than that, which nobody expected. So we came back and asked the sellers to split the repair costs, even though we had agreed that the seller wouldn't do any repairs or pay for any repairs. So I sent over the repair request with a cancellation of contract and said, I understand that we negotiated this up front, that you guys would not do any repairs. The pest report came back much higher than anticipated. So we're giving your seller the option. We're happy to, to abide by our contract and just cancel or the seller can help us with the repairs and we'll continue to move forward. They appreciated that. They decided to move forward with us, right? So even if we negotiate as is, if your buyer's gonna cancel, um, you're better off asking if there's a remedy that can be done before you just cancel the contract. Um, let's see here. 
Um, if you agree to repairs, right, those need to be completed prior to the close of escrow. Oftentimes anymore, we seem to be negotiating credits or reductions in purchase prices instead of those repairs, um, which is a whole nother conversation about what would be the best option there as far as for a buyer goes, which we can have on another day. Um, and so just remember that on section L of the contract is where it lists all the different contingencies. And there's like nine different contingencies as part of the contract. There's the physical investigation. There's the review of the preliminary title report. There is the review of the seller disclosures. There is leased and leaned items. There's HOA disclosures. Um, there's the sale of the buyer's property, if that's in play. And then there's three others that I can't come up with right now, but just know that they are there and they exist and they all list and you have to remove them all um, as part of that contingency time frame. Keep in mind too, that the buyer must also not just remove the contingency for review of the seller disclosures, but they also must return those disclosures signed. Okay, also keep in mind because we're representing the seller in a listing, that our seller has a responsibility to provide all the disclosures to the buyer, the SPQ, which is the seller property questionnaire, the transfer disclosure statement, the um, fire hardening disclosure if required um, due to the location of the property, the lead-based paint disclosure if it was built before 1978, and the earthquake hazards disclosure if it was built before 1965. And then you also have to do your agent visual inspection disclosure. Generally, I recommend doing that within 24 hours of an accepted offer. All of those forms have questions that need to be answered. This is why I highly recommend sending them to your sellers through the Glide program because it walks the seller through each and every question. Make sure they have an answer on each and every question. If they answer yes, it asks for an explanation. If your sellers have filled it out by hand, they need to make sure they answer every single question. And if they mark yes, they need an explanation. If we haven't answered every single question, we haven't given an explanation and we've marked yes. If they didn't initial each page, if they didn't sign the end, if your agent visual inspection disclosure isn't attached to your transfer disclosure statement, those disclosures are considered incomplete, okay? If you have not delivered complete disclosures to the buyer, they do not have to remove their, re their review of the seller disclosures contingency until you deliver those disclosures. Once you deliver those disclosures fully executed, they have to remove them either by the date of the contingency or five days, whichever is later. So if they had a 10 day inspection or a review of seller disclosures contingency, and you provided them with those fully executed disclosures on day seven of the contract, they now have an additional two days to review those disclosures because they have an additional five days after delivery before they have to remove that contingency. So be really conscious of when you're providing those disclosures so that you can keep the buyer within their timeframes for cancellation. Okay, any other questions about the contingencies, notice to perform, seller disclosures, making sure we stay on track. All right, fabulous. Once we move forward to the closing and possession, right? So we still wanna be in contact with the buyer even after they remove their contingencies. We wanna find out when they're gonna do their final walkthrough. If there were repairs that were supposed to be done, we wanna make sure we let them know when those repairs are supposed to be completed. Um, we wanna make sure that we meet with the appraiser at the property and provide them a full appraisal packet, um, which I will go over at a future training. In fact, that wasn't on the list. So we'll add it to the list. Let's see appraisal. Um, I usually provide the appraiser with an appraisal packet. I handpick my comps. I compare the comps to the subject property. I highlight all the features, updates, upgrades to the subject property, um, the reasons a buyer might want it. And I build my case for the contract price that we are in to help prevent a low appraisal. So I have a always provide that to the appraiser. Appraisers often have questions when they're at the property of, oh, the kitchen was updated. When was it updated? How long ago? They want to know, was it like in the last year, in the last five years, in the last 10 years? Because it makes a difference on their report. So I always try to be there for the appraisal. Okay. You don't have to be there for inspections as the listing agent. You don't have to be there for most things, but you do want to try to be there for the appraisal because it helps your seller be able to sell that house 
for the pr price that you are in contract on. The only time that I may not show up is if we have an appraisal guarantee that's large enough to cover any gap that we might encounter or if there's no appraisal contingency, okay? <clears throat> um, once we're moving forward towards that closing day, we still wanna be in contact with that lender, making sure that we know what's going on with the buyer's loan. I always check with the listing or the buyer's agent first, and then I check in with their lender to compare their stories and make sure they are the same. And keep in mind about five days before the close of escrow, that closing disclosure needs to go out to the buyers, right? That's a good sign that we're on track. If we know when that CD or that closing disclosure has gone out to the buyers to be acknowledged, because we all know that once that closing disclosure goes out to the buyers, we have to wait three days before those buyers can sign and before we can close. That's why it should go out about five days ahead of time, because that gives them three days to review it. It gives them a day to sign all the final paperwork, and it gives a day for the lender to fund and us to record. Okay, so I figure about five days prior to the close of escrow. If you have a 25 day close of escrow, then those closing disclosures should be in the buyer's hand by day 20. So leading up to day 20, 17, 18, 19, I'm checking in with that lender to see what's going on with that closing disclosure so that I can make sure we're going to close on time. Um, keep in mind your sellers need to leave the property free of any personal belongings and free of debris or trash. Okay, so the property does not need to be professionally clean. If they want to, they're welcome to, but there is no contractual obligation to leave it spotless and clean. Their obligation is to basically take a broom or rag and wipe out all the cabinets and sweep the floors and maybe vacuum the carpet, sweep out the garage, make sure if they had dogs, they clean up the dog poo, right? Free of debris, trash, lawn clippings, uh, branches, whatever that might be, right? That would all be considered trash and personal items. That's how they are supposed to leave the property. They are also supposed to leave the property in basically the same state as the date of the accepted offer. So if the lawn was mowed at the time that people were seeing and making offers on the property, then don't let the yard get overgrown and out of control at the close of escrow. The grass should be mowed again. Okay, so we need to make sure we cover this with our sellers so that they understand the expectation. Please make sure you go over with your sellers a few days in advance of their move out date, right? We want to find out when our sellers are moving, go in um, detail with them a few days before their move out date to go over the items again that are going to stay with the property. So if there's things negotiated, refrigerators, washer, dryer, whatever it might be, the shed, the cabinets, the shelves upstairs, if there were things negotiated to stay with the property, reiterate those whole curtains and curtain rod situation stay. Um, we want to go over those again to make sure that their intention is to leave those. There is nothing worse than the seller loads up their moving truck, they drive out to move out of state, and you go look at the property the next day to make sure it's ready to hand keys to the buyer and the refrigerator is now missing that was supposed to stay with the property. Wah, wah, wah. I guess who's going to have to take care of that one? <laughs> you are. <laughs> okay. So um, just some, yep. Oh, I thought somebody had a question. Um, so just some things to pay attention to as we're moving towards that close that close of escrow um, time frame, right? Um, make sure that you anticipate the curve, right? Try to avoid pitfalls. This is why we talk about having pre-listing inspections done, right? So that we don't have surprises. We know what to expect in the buyer's um, inspections. In fact, oftentimes the seller has inspections done, the buyer won't pay for inspections. So you know exactly what they're going to find. Um, what should be happening, right? We talked about what is happening or delayed, what might go wrong. Is there anything that you can do to avoid it? So we're going to try to head off those problems before they exist. Toodles, Anastasia, right? What actions needed right now? We talked about the seller disclosures. We talked about lender requests, um, deadlines, Items renegotiated at the last minute. Don't get bullied into giving up more than you need to. That's all I'm going to say about that. And as you're, you work with your mentor through those first through few transactions, they can help walk you through those things that get renegotiated at the last minute. We had a transaction going um, one time we represented the buyer and the buyer had sent in a repair request with the sellers had agreed to. We removed all of the contingencies. The set, the buyers came back the week of the close of escrow. It was like three days before the close of escrow. 
and said, hey, we decided we want these things taken care of too, as far as repairs go. And we were like, well, the seller has no incentive to do this because we've already removed all of our contingencies. You're locked into buying this house. However, that being said, we can still ask for them. Just be prepared that they may not agree to them. And the seller actually went ahead and agreed to everything. So there's never too late for a buyer to ask for things, but just know because a buyer's asking for it does not need, mean that the seller has to comply with those items. Okay. If you're having problems getting a hold of the lender during the transaction, make sure you're in contact with that listing agent or with the buyer's agent to make sure that they are in contact with them. Ask them to have the lender reach out to you. If you're still having problems, look for the lender's manager's phone number and reach out to them and just say, hey, I'm having a tough time getting some you know, call back or getting information from the lender. We're trying to find out what's going on. It's okay to go above and beyond to make sure your sellers are taken care of. Okay, um, always make sure that you're reminding, remind, remind, remind of timeframes and deadlines that are due as we move through the transaction. And keep in mind that in California, the contingency removal has to be in writing. So if I've got an inspection contingency coming up to be due to be removed on a certain day, if I just let that day come and go, the contingency doesn't automatically remove itself. The contingency drags on until it's it's removed in writing, which allows the buyer to cancel based on that can that contingency. The longer it floats, that's why I'm never hesitant as a seller's agent or listing agent to provide that notice to perform. Okay, our notices to perform in the contract default to a two day notice to perform. So if I served the notice to perform today. They would have all day tomorrow, which is Friday, and all day Saturday to perform. Now, keep in mind, we've run into the weekend and the holiday again. So they actually don't have to perform until the end of the day on Tuesday. So if I served a notice to perform today, I couldn't actually cancel the contract if I wanted to until Wednesday morning. Okay, so it's a two day. As we're moving close to that close escrow time frame, that is a three day demand to close escrow. So if they've done everything else, they've performed on everything else, but we're just delaying that close of escrow, in order for your sellers to cancel the contract, you would need to issue that three day demand to close escrow, which would give them three days to perform before having being able to cancel the contract. Okay. Any questions so far? All right. Who no. helps? Do you mean the... Oh, yeah. Did you have a question, Adriana? No, I just, I said no. Okay. <laughs> no questions. Perfect. Thank you. Um, who helps during the phase of um, closing the sale, right? Um, you have to be reliant on so many other people, right? You've got the lender working on it. You've got the buyer's agent working on it. You've got whoever the inspectors or investigators are that the buyer has hired. You've got um, your own team of people, your transaction coordinator, yourself, right? So if um, the things that help during the, the contract to close process are going to be competence, right? Does the person really know what they're doing? Have they mastered their craft, right? Does the home inspector have years of experience? Are the are the is the buyer's agent good at communicating to their buyer, right? And taking control of their buyer, or can you tell that the buyer's ruling the situation and they're not good with communication? I've actually gotten on the phone with agents and their clients from the other side of the transaction before because I could tell that the the agent didn't know how to handle their their clients and they needed help. And so I said, hey, would it help if I got on and explained to them how this works or what we're asking or the, you know, that how we're wanting to respond so that we can create a win-win situation? They're like, oh my gosh, you would do that? Yes, absolutely, right? I'm trying to create a win-win, right? So um, competence comes into play, education, right? Does this person have the training and education that allows them to perform at their highest level? dedication is they are they dedicated to performing their craft at the highest level and are they committed to the win-win transaction and getting the transaction closed and attitude plays a lot into how the transaction flows right and keep in mind that oftentimes things fall apart during the escrow process 
and being able to stay positive with your clients will help it to move smoothly through that process. And sometimes there's a lot of scrambling that goes on so that you can fix the problem before you have to communicate it to a client. Okay. Or if you are, um, you know, the buyer's agent comes and they've got a, a whole bunch of problems that they don't know how to solve and they've come to you and their buyer wants to quit and, and move on. Um, thinking about some solutions that can help them with their clients to help them continue to move forward so that you can come with a winning attitude and trying to create that. I always come back to that win-win situation, right? We want to create a winning environment for all people involved in the transaction. Ultimately, we all want the same goal. We all want the transaction closed. So if there's something that we can do, advice we can give, um, you know, pointers we can give to help move that transaction along, never hesitate to share those. Um, please make sure you're communicating and following up during the entire transaction. Make sure you're staying in contact with the other agent. Make sure you're staying in contact with the title company, the lender, and your clients. We've talked about this before this. We move through the transaction. Those first couple weeks are really busy. Um, you know, the buyers are scheduling inspections. So you're constantly letting the um, sellers know about inspections and appraisals and that the deposit was received and a repair request and the response. And then it kind of dies out for a couple of weeks and it's really easy just to kind of fall off and stop communicating. Make sure you don't stop communicating, right? Even if nothing new has evolved and always set that next time that, hey, if nothing else comes up, I'll touch base with you on Wednesday just to give you an update, right? So we're always going to set, when are we going to touch base with them next time so that they don't have to wonder if something's falling apart or if we're just ignoring them or we've forgotten about them, okay? Um, implement your follow-up systems and your CRM. You have all of your contacts in your CRM. The Real Suite has the ability to set up tasks. So you can set those tasks, those callback reminders, those contingency due time frames can all be set up inside of there. So it'll remind you, hey, remind listing agent that the contingency due um, time frame is due in two days, right? So you can set all those tasks and reminders up so that you can automate your follow-up system and you don't forget to do things. Any questions about that transaction to close process? It's kind of a broad overview. Nope. Nope. You're good? So far. So far, so good. <laughs> Fabulous. All right. Um, once we have the closing, we want to create clients for life. And this goes for both our buyers and our sellers. Okay. We can also create clients for life with the buyers of our listings. So just a heads up, because approximately 75% of, of agents never or rarely follow up after the sale of a property. We call those orphaned clients. Okay. We don't want to orphan our clients and we want to pick up all the orphan clients that we can. So when you look at the NAR, the National Association of Realtors um, statistics, it's like 80 some odd percent of people say they'll use the same real estate agent again. But the percentage that actually does is like down near, I think it's like, I'll say 25%. I think it's lower than that. I think it's closer to like 10% of people actually use the same agent again because their agents don't follow up with them. So please make sure that you have a follow-up plan in place in your CRM. And we'll talk about what that looks like here in a minute and adopt the buyers of your listings. Okay, send them, you've got their address. They just bought your listing, right? So you know what their mailing address is. Send them a congratulatory card after the close of escrow Swing by and pop in on them and check in on with a, you know, a couple of weeks after closing and just introduce yourself as, hi, you know, I'm Amy, I'm the listing agent. I just wanted to see how your move-in process was going to make sure you're getting settled and make sure you didn't have any questions about the property, right? Adopt them, become friends with them, build relationship, add them to your database. Hey, can I get your email address, right? Or your phone number in case the seller thinks of something they should have shared with you that they missed out on. Or can I give you, let's trade phone numbers. And that way, if you have any questions, you can reach out to me directly, right? Totally okay to do that. Their agency relationship ended once that contract ended with the other agent. So you can go in there and start building that relationship and make them your own client. Okay. Our goal is to create raving fans. And we want to make sure that we set ourselves apart from other agents so that we can watch the repeat and referral business come in. Okay. 
Part of getting referrals is asking for them. Okay, and use, we have that access to rate my agent inside of the um, your OneSuite login or your um, OneZone login. Um, go in there and create that account in the rate my agent so that you can send that out to your clients for reviews. Please, please, please get reviews. You want reviews on Zillow. You want reviews on realtor.com. You want reviews on Google and you want reviews on Yelp. Okay. If you're so having a problem. Yeah. Sorry, just about rate my agent. Do we have rate my agent through real to one or do you still have we to do. pay? We do. I believe we have a free version through Realty One. Okay. I, I signed up for it. I got an email about it. And I think I signed up for it, not linked through it. And they told me it was like $400 a year to be able to actually post the thing to, um, sorry, to actually post the review to Google or like to Instagram. To like, get it? Yeah. They told me I had to pay for it. It was $400 a month or Sorry, $400 a year, whatever year. that is a month. All right. Well, if it is, I haven't investigated it that far. I've just kind of logged in and played with it a little bit. Um, so if, in fact, you do have to pay for it, you can solicit those reviews yourself. You can make it fun and engaging. So you could like run a quarterly contest for anybody who leaves you a review. You could like this quarter, make your focus be Google and send them a link and, you know, send out where they are going to get a, you know, a gift card for uh, Cold Stone Creamery, right? If they leave a review, maybe they get a maybe they get a five dollar gift card, or maybe they're entered into a contest for a hundred dollar gift card at the end of the quarter for every review that they leave, and they can get you know two entries if they leave a review on Google, and one if they do it on Zoom or Zillow, and one if they do it on Yelp, right? And then next month we might or next quarter we might focus in on Yelp and do the same thing again, but try to get more of your reviews built up on Yelp. Okay, got it. Right. Yeah, so just, if they're gonna charge if they're gonna charge you on rate my agent, I would do it for free. Yeah, I just went and double checked again and it is the what four hundred dollars a year type of thing. Yeah. So I got it I had someone do it once. I'm gonna follow up with him. I actually got a week and a half till I follow up with him again. Uh so I'm just gonna ask him to do it do another review, but for your reviews, do you usually get a couple sentences? This gentleman, for me, um, did about one and a half sentences. Um, so I don't mind how long a review they give. I usually don't dictate. I usually just send out the links and say, hey, do you mind leaving me a review? With I do a direct link for whichever one I'm trying to solicit for that month. Okay, understood. Yep, make it easy. All they have to do is click on it. It takes them right to that review page. Um, so it makes it super simple for them. But yeah, if rate my agent's going to charge you, I would do it for free. I'm cheap. Cheap. We like to say frugal. <laughs> no, no, I'm just cheap. <laughs> I'm right there with you. Maybe it's a realtor uh, trait. Maybe. <laughs> um, the other thing that you need to do is ask for referrals, right? I mentioned that before, but ask for those referrals. Who else do you know who is looking to buy, sell, or invest in real estate, right? Who should? Who do you know that I should know? right? Get those referrals so that you can stay on top of them and create a winning business. You may want to create some sort of referral rewards program. For years, we did um, Cutco as our closing item. So we had a whole series of Cutco knives that you could win depending on how many closings you've done with us, right? Repeat business, we're adding to your Cutco set. And then for referrals, we had the other cheaper um, Cutco items. Cutco is nice because they brand it to you. So it's got like your logo and stuff on it. It's really neat. Every time I use my knife, I am reminded that I'm part of Petard Riddle and Associates. So it's kind of cool. Um, but they also have like ice cream scoops and pie scoopers and pizza cutters and all sorts of fun things like that that are more in like the 30 to $40 range. Again, they're still branded to you. They're just in a lower price. And we use those as our referral rewards program. So as people refer to us business, they would also be able to continue to add to their Cutco set with those referrals. So it was kind of a fun idea. Um, you might want to figure out like, oh, if you send me a referral, you get a $5 gift card. When they close, you get a, you know, a gift card to the restaurant of your choice, right? Those referrals are gold. That's legion that we don't have to do. So um, just some things to think about there. Um, let's see, make sure you put together a after sale action plan 
that you implement as soon as you complete the transaction. Even for those, uh, those clients, because we've been talking about listings as well that are moving out of the area, stay in touch with them because they still know people in the area that you're in and you may be able to pick up more referrals, right? So every client gets added to your after sale action plan um, as soon as you complete that transaction without exception, unless they are a client that you no longer ever want to see or talk to again. Okay, those clients do exist. You get through the transaction, you realize halfway through the transaction, these are horrible people and you want nothing to do with them. They don't have to get added. Okay, be consistent in completing all of the activities in your after sale action plan for it to produce results, right? If you're inconsistent, your results will be inconsistent as well. Um, and things like a closing gift, right? I would put those for like two weeks out or like a month after closing. Maybe the week after closing, you remind them if they were a buyer of their home warranty, if they got one and you make sure they have the deals of their home warranty. Maybe at a month out, you set them up on that um, monthly neighborhood update through Real Scout so that on a monthly basis, they're getting that neighborhood update and you can let them know that they you've done that. So they keep track of what's going on in the neighborhood in which they are living right? Make sure you update their address in your CRM system. Please put their home anniversary as well. If you had a seller that is moving to another house, hopefully you got both transactions, both the sale and the buy. But if you didn't find out which house they purchased, maybe they moved out of the area. Hopefully you got the referral, but maybe they're renting. Make sure you get their address, update it, and then make sure you keep up to date on their home anniversaries. Okay. Um, so just some things you can do following up after the, tr the sale as you trickle and drip in on them. Um, as I mentioned before, add the buyers of your listings to your CRM. You have their names. They were on the purchase contract. Add them in there. Stop by their house a couple times. Work on getting their contact information. Share your contact information with them. Um, and then keep them up to date on your systematic follow-up plan. Okay. Okay. Um, you are going to take all that you've learned and you're going to put it to work there after the sale, right? So your clients were lucky to have an agent as skilled as you. So you got to believe that they want to refer their friends, family, and coworkers to you. They are going to be unaccustomed to your level of care and consistency, and they will brag about you to other people. Maybe make sure they have five to 10 business cards of yours after the close of escrow in case they run across anybody else looking to buy or sell a home, right? Maybe you want to throw them like a small housewarming get together after the close of escrow. Maybe you're going to budget a couple hundred dollars out of every closing to throw a housewarming party for your clients so that you can meet their friends, family, and neighbors. How cool would that be, right? Show up with the pinwheel tray and a charcuterie board and some water or sodas and host a housewarming party so they can get to know their neighbors or their friends can come see the house. Super cool activity that you can do to help gain potential clients. Okay. Um, after the close of escrow, we want to move them to what we call a 36 to convert. Okay. So we want to move them to that 36 to convert, which would be at least a systematic process of reaching out to them with 36 different touches throughout the year. That would be four calls. Um, I wouldn't say calls, text, or visits. I would say four calls, four texts, and a couple of visits every year. In fact, I would almost say four visits, those personal connections, right? So once a quarter, you're going to call them. Once a quarter, you're going to text them. And once a quarter, you're going to stop by and drop something off on their doorstep or send them something in the mail that's not a card, okay? Something of value. You're going to send them out tw one newsletter per month, okay? It can be printed or it can be in uh, email format. doesn't matter to me. You're going to send them 12 market updates per year. I think I said 12 newsletters per month. You're going to send them one newsletter per month for 12 total throughout the year. Same thing with your market updates. And please make sure they're staggered. So if your newsletter always goes out on the first, then you know your market updates go out on the 15th. <laughs> You're gonna send them out two cards. 
Okay, those are great touches. Um, you could send them out a birthday card and pick a holiday, pick a random holiday. I highly recommend you pick a random holiday, like happy 4th of July or happy President's Day or happy winter solstice or whatever it might be where they're not getting a bunch of other mail. If you send them Christmas cards, they're going to get stuck on the board with all their other Christmas cards. There's nothing wrong with sending out like a holiday Christmas type card or a Hanukkah card or whatever it is that you celebrate. Um, but I would pick one other holiday that you're going to surprise them with. And then I would also, it's not on here, but I would also make sure that you send them a happy home anniversary card every year on the day that they purchase the home. Keep in mind, you can belong to places like send out cards or AM cards where it allows you to send those cards out electronically. They don't go via email. They actually send a physical card out. Um, you can pick the card, you can pick what it says on the inside, and then you mail it out. It's cheaper than going to the store and buying cards and then sticking a stamp on it, especially with the price of stamps right now. So you may want to look at one of those services. You can do it either where you have a certain number of cards per month, or you can just do it per card. And then also make sure that you add them in on social media and that you systematically are reaching out to them on social media. Okay. I would say once a quarter, you probably want to be commenting on their posts at a minimum, and probably once a quarter, maybe sending them a direct message, just checking in on them, right? All these different ways that we can reach out and connect with people. So that would be well more than 36 touches over the course of the next year. I would recommend that you set those up into your CRM so that it's automated. It's going to tell you when to call them. It's going to tell you when to text them. It's going to tell you when their pop by is due. And also put together a calendar at the beginning of the year with what your plan is so that you know exactly what pop buys you're going to do on what corners or quarters. If you're like, Amy, what's a pop by? That would be like something fun that you would drop off on their doorstep or send to their mail. So maybe it's like at the beginning of the year, you send out a little magnetic calendar. Maybe you put together a little, um, we're doing a little scarf for um, St. Patrick's Day. I was like, what's the next month? St. Patrick's Day. Um, where for their dogs and we're going to, or for their pets and asking them to send us a picture of their pet in the scarf. So we're trying to make it interactive and fun. So it can just be fun things that you're going to drop off for them just to remind them that you're in real estate and that you're doing fun things. You want to set up your vendor list, right? Inside of um, one of the programs we have access to, I can't remember which one it is, but you can set up your vendor list, right? So you can put all your vendors in there that they might want access to your favorite restaurants, your favorite contractors, your handyman, your flooring companies, your painters, your whatever it might be. You can put them, your dog walker, your um, grooming salon, your hairstylist, your nail salon. You can put them all in there and you can share those with your clients so that you are the expert in the area and that you're providing them with value year round. That gives them a reason to continue to check in with you and continue to check those sites. Okay, creating clients for life. Any questions about any of those things? All righty, that's all I have for you right now. That wraps up our first round of rev up for the first quarter of 2023. Um, I would keep in your one habit of adding at least three people to your database on a daily basis, five days a week, making three phone calls about real estate each day um, of the week and sending out six notes or thank yous, um, probably to those same people that you added to your database and you had phone calls with, but it could be somebody else. Send out thank yous in the mail. There's nothing better than getting a handwritten thank you in your mailbox because most of your mail is junk mail. Does anybody have any questions about contract to close, creating customers for life, or anything else that we covered or did not cover during our Rev Up series? I do not. Thank you so much, Amy. You're very informative and you make it, this process so much easier. You are welcome. I cannot agree more. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I mean, I pay Anastasia to say nice things about me. So it, it, it's nice that the stranger, mm -hmm. well, you're not really a stranger, but new people also say that about me. There you go. <laughs> I'm joking. I don't She's pay the Anastasia. Best. She's the best. <laughs> All right. Make sure to log your attendance. Abby just stuck that link in the oh. 
chat box and be watching for that new calendar to come out with all the new um, trainings on it. Like I said, we're going to expand. I've broken out like the listing trainings into like a whole month and the buyer trainings into like a whole month of buyer trainings. So we're going to go a lot more detail and in depth into things. Um, so log that training, mark your calendars. We'll start back up on the 28th and what we're covering will come out shortly, but just know it's the same schedule Monday, Tuesday, 11 AM and Thursdays at four. And we'll always record those. So you can catch them on recording. If you aren't able to catch it live. Understood. Fabulous. I will uh, see you at summit if you're going, and if you're not going, I will See you um, on the 28th. I will not right, be going, so I'll see you then. <laughs> uh, we'll see you on the 28th, Bradley, next year. Yes, ma'am, next year. Next year. Fabulous. Right. Bye, ladies. Have a good night. You Bye, too. Bradley. Good night, everybody. Bye. Good night. Um, question on that. Yeah. Um, he wants, so they're Eastern They're Eastern Indian. Uh -huh. So he, he wants like an area where it's more Eastern Indian than, how do I... Do we have something for demographics? No, we technically like can't identify where those neighborhoods would be uh, would anyways, because right. that know, would be steering. steering. Steering, right. Yeah. Um, so just let them know that you can't, that there's there's nowhere that you can go that you could look up that information and it would be a violation of the fair housing True. Um, rules That's and true. regulations for you to show them those to designate those neighborhoods. But if they identify which neighborhoods those are, that you would be happy to limit the search the neighborhoods that they rec that they would like. They just want a safe area. So, and they're pre qualified for five eighty five, but they have okay. forty thousand saved up. So technically, I can look for what six twenty five for them up to. Um, if they're 585, 625 is a pretty good stretch because you're talking almost forty thousand dollars that they would need to well, come that down. Would their, that would be their down payment. Oh, okay. So their loan amounts 585. Yeah, and they have forty thousand okay. saved up. Um, yeah, plus closing costs. Have they gotten pre-approved yet? Yeah, yeah. They what they went it? through um, Omni through Zillow. And okay, what did Omni say their max purchase price was? Um, he's. I told him to send me the paper, um, okay. so that way I have it for my file. So I'll look at it when I get home. Hopefully, he yeah. sent it to me. Look at that, and then whoever the loan officer is attached to that file, just give him a call and confirm what the max purchase price is. Because even okay. though they have forty thousand available, like I don't know if that's a forty thousand down payment, or I don't know if that's including closing costs or is it really 30,000 plus, you know, so you just need to have the conversation with the lender to find out what their max is. Okay. Um, right. And then the other thing is, is what I would recommend is when they see houses come available, I would direct them to like the crime statistics. And I think Zillow has that on uh, the Zillow page for the listing. It shows kind okay. of the crime stats, but if not, I would um, just direct them to the crime statistics for those, that area or that city. Yeah. And I mean, pretty much, you know, which areas are good and bad and back of hell, so. Yeah, but you're technically, what might be good to you might not be good to them. Yeah. So again, that becomes a very subjective thing. So it could be discrimination or steering if you try to like, be like, oh, that's a safe neighborhood or that's not a safe neighborhood. Um, so you may just want to be like, hey, before you put an offer in on this house or before we go look at that house, you may want to look at the crime stats. Like that's kind of my default. <laughs> and the Megan's law. Think it's if I think it's not a safe area, <laughs> right. Okay. Or, um, or sometimes I like point out the neighbor properties. Like we're looking at a property. You can be like, yeah, if you look around this neighborhood, like it doesn't look very well kept and there's a lot of like junky cars. So you just may want to double check crime stats before we, you decide if you want to put an offer in. Okay. Or they could always, you know, go sit at the house, you know, in the evenings and see what's going on in that neighborhood too. <laughs> Stalker. <laughs> yeah, totally. There's nothing wrong with that. <laughs> okay okay so those are all the kind of the ways to get around the discriminating and steering um is just to to recommend those those actions okay okay all right yes ma'am cool. if i have any other questions uh i got you on speed out sounds good and all i'll right. see you in a couple days yes ma'am i'll be there friday right. or sunday 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 and you you fly in what monday sunday night 
Sunday night. Okay. Yep, I get there at like seven o'clock. Oh, okay. Sounds good. Yep. Maybe we'll have to get together for dinner one night. Sounds good. All right. Talk to you later. Toodles. Okay. Bye.